Hello and welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. I'm Victoria Scholar. The video gaming industry is expected to have reached $159 billion in revenues in 2020 and gaming is more popular than ever. Now with 65% of American adults playing video games, how can investors get in on the game as well? Joining me to discuss is JP Lee. He's an ETF product manager from Van Eck, an investment firm which has recently published a white paper on the subject. JP, great to chat to you. Uh, let's start off by just getting a sense of the size of the industry. And can you give us a clue as to sort of how much it's grown in recent years and, and what you're kind of expecting ahead? Yeah, sure. So first of all, I hate to do this to you, but the 159 billion number has actually been revised upwards to 175 wow. billion. And that data comes from a, a company called Newzu. So last year, the, you know, with the pandemic and everybody was playing video games all the time, 159 was their first estimate. And then as the year went on, they revised it upwards towards like, I want to say in November, December up to 175. So we're talking about $175 billion a year industry, reaching literally billions of people around the world. So we think of it in terms of a structural growth story, a long-term structural growth story, which means the industry is growing, but it's not happening in a bubble. There are other things contributing and providing support to the growth. So what are those things? I mean, you think about consumer demand, uh, changing consumer demand. Like today's consumers, they want to be uh, experiencing interactive online entertainment. And you can see that reflected in kind of other media industries like social media, for example. And in a lot of ways, video games are becoming social media platforms and uh, how people are using the games. And then another one of the things that's really supporting the growth of the industry is simple demographics, right? So if you think about somebody who's 40 or under, I'm 37 and I play video games and I'm an adult. People think that, oh, video games are just for little kids. It's just for 12 year olds with their, their parents' you know, credit cards. That's just simply not true. These are adults playing video games, which is key because they're making money and using and spending their money in these new ways that prior generations did it. I was really struck by that figure. Uh, the 65% of American adults are now playing video games. So interesting. Like you say, it's not just about children or younger people anymore. It seems to be crossing a wide range of demographics. But in terms of actually how people are accessing these games, I mean, is it all about mobile these days? Is there a massive shift away from PC and console? I don't think there's a massive shift away from PC and console. I think mobile is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So if you think about your PC player or your console player, that is somebody who's willing to invest three to $500 on a console or up to $1,000 to $2,000 on a PC. Mobile gaming is accessible to everyone. So there's a, they call it total available market, the TAM. And the TAM for mobile gaming is much bigger because the cost of entry is so much lower. Everybody has a mobile phone. And that leads back to the, the thing I was gonna say about demographics is this isn't just for developed countries, right? It's not just for the UK or United States or Germany. This is happening in the emerging markets world too, in China, India, Brazil, Indonesia. And mobile adoption isn't at capacity in those countries yet. So people are still getting their first mobile phones. And what do you do when you get your first mobile phone? You download Angry Birds or whatever to figure out how to use it. You know, So that's another thing that's really providing long-term support for the mobile sector is this emerging markets consumer story. Talk to us a bit about the subscription and the revenue model. Isn't in-game spending becoming really important these days? That's a great question. So the old model is game as a product, right? So that's when you drive down to Toys R Us, you, you spend $50 and you get your Mario Kart and a little cartridge, right. right? And you come home, you play it and plug it in and that's it, right? You, you, you spend $150 on Mario Kart one time. The recurring model is completely different because right now Nintendo or whoever has connection to your living room through the internet, right? So there's more technological capabilities to allow one button, you know, one click transactions, right? You see a game and, you know, you're sc scrolling through your online menu on your Nintendo, your Xbox, and you're like, oh, I want to play that game. Boom, click. Um, it's got my credit card already. I just buy it with one instant button. So the technology is there, but then from, from a business model perspective, it's opening up a lot of possibilities and companies are doing it different ways. So the easiest way to think about it and I think we start here is, is the Fortnite example, right? So Fortnite is a free game. It was a crazy successful game back in 2017, 2018. 
it made $2.4 billion in 2018. That's a free game, right? So you can go on to your phone or your computer, or Xbox, or whatever, and download Fortnite for free. And once you're in the game, then you're spending money and you can spend money on a costume. They have these things called battle passes, which is like a monthly or, or every three months, they'll release a new season. So you buy the battle pass for the season. If you play, you know, if you play the game and you bought the battle pass, you'll unlock digital items like characters, costumes, you know, weapons, whatever it is. And that kind of gets to the heart of the in-game spending is that instead of this one $50 purchase from Mario Kart, I get the game for free and I'm just kind of spending as I go, depending on what I want. It increases the amount of revenue the company can make off a single consumer. And it also increases the potential longevity of a game. And Grand Theft Auto is a great example of that. Grand Theft Auto 5 is still like the leading revenue generator for Take Two. That game came out in 2013. It's an eight year old game, right? And people are still spending money over and over and over in that game. So yeah, new business models are happening and it's very exciting. Yeah, it's also interesting how games like Fortnite tie themselves into the popularity of other platforms, like through community engagement, for example, by platforms like Twitch and YouTube. That's really important as well, right? Yeah, so there's this whole secondary, like there's this, there's all these websites or platforms that are related to video games, but are not necessarily video games. So Twitch is a great example of that. It's a social media platform where people play video games and watch other people play video games. Discord is another example of a platform which is essentially a chat service, but people can use Discord in conjunction with their gameplay. And there's a game called Among Us that came out over the summer. And people, you basically needed Discord to play Among Us, right? Because you're playing with teams and you don't know who the killer is and blah, blah, blah. So there's these secondary websites that are also very integral to the video gaming ecosystem. And, and again, it goes back to the idea that video games are kind of moving towards this social media service right where you're hanging out with your friends you're playing games yeah you want to win but it's also about the hanging out aspect is very important the ability to you know have fun online with your friends at the same time and interact yeah so so there's no doubt that um covid would have provided a tailwind to gaming in the sense that a lot of people were stuck at home you know because of lockdowns is there a risk that when we go back to normal life, we could see a slight decline in the industry or, or was it just a case that COVID accelerated trends that were already in place? Yeah, that's kind of what we say is that, uh, first of all, COVID 2020 was an acceleration, right? So like you saw increased adoption, but these trends were already in place. And I think that the risk that the, the world reopens and video games go away and these companies go out of business is, you know, it, I don't see that happening, right? There's going to be right now, generally speaking with the video game industry, we're at all time highs for revenues. We're at all time highs for engagement and number of users playing. So these companies as a, another general rule, these are growth companies, right? They have high, high valuations, high growth figures, low dividends, right? These are growth. And so when something happens to the future earnings expectations of growth companies, the stock price takes a takes a hit, right? So when the reopening happens, there definitely will be some kind of evaluation reset as the forward expectations come down a little bit and everybody just kind of takes a breather. I mean, the basket of stocks in our ETF, uh, Bayonet Vectors Video Gaming and Esports ETF ticker is ESPO. They had a great year in 2020. They were up uh, over 80%. This year, in the last couple of weeks, the growth trade, quote unquote, you know, there's a great rotation out of tech into value. If that's happening or not, I, I don't think I can comment. You know, there's no way to know if that's really happening. But sure, there will be some kind of, a, you know, pullback or, or correction or breathing room. But I think the long term trends are definitely in place, especially when you take into account things like mobile gaming, things like emerging markets, consumers, you know, five years from now, I do believe more people will be playing video games than they are now. Okay, so esports is a key component of your ETF. How does that fit into the broader video gaming industry? And could you just provide us with a definition as well, just yeah. in case our listeners yeah. don't know? So esports are when there are teams or individuals competing against each other for prize money in a video game, right? So think about soccer, football, whatever you want, you know, whatever your sport is. And it's the same thing. There's five to 10,000 people in the stands. 
there's two people or two teams facing off in the middle. And instead of playing a physical sport like soccer or football, they're playing a computer game, right? And, and so that is, I think, esports in a nutshell. And esports got a lot of attention, a lot of hype, 2017, 2018, because of the fact that people were finding out about it for the first time. And, you know, there was pictures of the Barclays Center here in New York City sold out and, you know, 22,000 people in the stands for, for an esports tournament. And that opened up a lot of people's eyes to it. But from my perspective, so going back to the first numbers we were talking about, $175 billion a year for video games. Esports is a $1 billion a year industry. So it's a much, much, much smaller industry. And the way it's been set up and the, and the way it's set up now is that the video game publishers are really in a very powerful spot within the esports ecosystem because they own the game. And in recent years, they've started launching their own leagues. So if you think about all the money that's sloshing around in a, a given sports league, the owner of the league is going to be making the majority of the money, right? So as the league owner, as the, the game owner, publishers are really in this very powerful position. I guess one trend that's kind of happened over the last few years is that there are a lot of these private esports specific organizations that were basically private teams, right? So there's teams out there and they're competing in these esports tournaments and they have kind of shifted their focus from I'm going to I'm going to enter all these tournaments and I'm going to win a million bucks and we're going to get sponsorships and they're becoming more of lifestyle brands and they're really focused more on this twitch ecosystem right where they're trying to become a, an entertainer or a streamer and they're not necessarily the best in the world of the game but they're making millions of dollars because tons of people are watching them and they're selling merchandise and they're getting sponsored by people so esports is a very specific idea of two people playing competitive video games but in reality the ecosystem is a lot broader than that and has kind of evolved over the last few years as more people have entered and things have developed. And very finally, what do you think is next in the world of esports and video gaming and why should investors continue to be interested in this long term theme? Yeah, I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of M&A activity. And I think that going forward, we should continue to expect M&A like mergers and acquisitions where and again, the mergers and acquisitions are being driven this by the same thing that's affecting the broader industry, right? So some of the M&As that we've seen recently is, you know, EA purchased a company called Blue Mobile. You know, it's a mobile company, right? So they're, they're, EA said they're immediately doubling their mobile presence. So there's a lot of M&A in the mobile space because it's, in a lot of ways, it's easier to buy your growth than it is to build it from scratch, right? So if you think about the mobile game market, there's tons of new new entrants. Everybody's trying to launch a mobile game. It's very competitive, right? So these companies like EA or Activision or Tencent or these big boys, they say to themselves, well, do I want to invest in a game, you know, these millions of dollars in this game that might not work and nobody cares about, or am I just going to buy somebody that's already doing it, right? So M&A is happening. The idea of cloud gaming is continuing to percolate, whether or not it really comes out. I, think, I don't know if there's, some, there's still some technological hurdles that need to be uh, overcome before cloud gaming becomes a real option. But that's kind of also driving m and activity. Microsoft bought this studio called ZeniMax. They own all this great IP like Skyrim and Fallout. And, and the thinking is that Microsoft could now release the next Skyrim or Fallout as an Xbox exclusive, right? So positioning for the cloud wars, let's say five to 10 years out and mobile gaming m and that, That's kind of what I'm seeing in the market right now. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, JP, for your contribution today. It's been great chatting to you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. And thank you so much to the listeners for tuning in to our podcast today, IG's Trading the Markets. And if you did enjoy it, make sure to subscribe. For more videos like these, subscribe to our YouTube channel, IG UK, and make sure to follow us on Twitter. We're at IGTV.